Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Baron Schwartz. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vivid Cortex. And I'm going to talk with you today about how we build our agents uh, for our software as a service product. Um, you probably know me from my time at Percona and as the author maybe of High Performance MySQL. This is my contact information. I'll put this at the end again. Um, feel free to get in touch with me and uh, ask me any questions. I'm happy to discuss whatever. This is us this morning um, with Tim from Dyne doing our CrossFit Tech Wad. This is going to become a uh, it's going to become a conference tradition. We're confident of that. This is just afterwards. You notice the excellent selfie technique. <laughs> Um, so we're going to try and tweet. Um, the, my co-founder um, is the one in the middle, Kyle, over here. Um, Kyle's a hardcore CrossFitter, and Kyle and I met in the gym that he owns. And uh, I've been doing CrossFit for a couple of years, and I think Tim's been doing it even longer. So we're going to try and tweet TechWad whenever we're at conferences, and we can do some early morning craziness together. This is a, a couple of screenshots of what we're doing at Vivid Cortex. We're building um, database performance management. So you know, what AppDynamics and New Relic and AppNeta and all of these companies do for the application code, measuring where the work is done and all of those kinds of things. We're doing that for the database starting with MySQL. Um, it's, there's a lot of data to process and there's a lot of visualization challenges and so forth. And we're using an agent-based architecture, um, sending all of our data up through APIs into our software as a service and, and everything is then in a web, um, web interface. So there's unique challenges with running the agents in situations like this, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So let's talk about some of the requirements um, for the agents. The, the title of my talk was originally running an ROUS resistant um, agent-based service in Go, and so I have to include fire swamps here, right? Um, and the idea was that the, the environment in which we're deploying these agents, which is our customers, servers, is completely out of our control. Um, so we cannot, nor do we have the right to expect um, any, any sort of dependencies or assumptions about configuration or what kind of operating system we're running on. Um, you know, we can say we only support certain operating systems, but we can't realistically, in, in today's day and age, we can't say, you know, you need to have a certain version of Ruby installed with certain libraries, and you need to have um, the Java runtime installed and all of these kinds of things. We can't make those kinds of requirements because our competitors don't make those kinds of requirements, or, or our or more modern competitors don't make those kinds of requirements. And so that's a competitive disadvantage. Our install is, is almost brain dead simple. You run a shell script or uh, install with um, Puppet or Chef or whatever as you prefer, and the only information you need is your agent's uh, API token. Everything else needs to be taken from there. So if you're installing with the shell script, you know, you curl and, and execute a shell script, you give it the API token and you're done. And that's the way it needs to be. Um, but this environment into which we're installing these agents is, you know, is something that we actually have to cope with whatever we find there. And I refer to it as a fire swamp, and there's lots of ROUSs in those fire swamps. So some requirements uh, for our agents is that they need to be memory and CPU efficient because we're actually doing difficult computer science kinds of things. Um, you know, this, we're not sort of, you know, just grabbing some stats off the proc file system or something like that. There's some real computation that needs to be done here. And we need to have minimal impact. Um, we need to do a lot of these things concurrently. And we need to do that correctly. Um, it needs to be robust, it needs to be resilient against all kinds of errors, including ones that we can't imagine or foresee. As I mentioned, it needs to be dependency free, so for example, we can't demand a certain version of system libraries or something like that. Um, we need to be able to control our agents remotely to a pretty good extent, and they need to manage themselves um, without a whole lot of uh, uh, hand-holding from us, and everything in your environment is then auto-discovered. So this is, this is kind of the, the, the high-level requirements that I started out with when deciding how to build our agents. And given all of that, the question is, what language should we use? I mean, you already know, spoiler alert, that we use Go. Um, but there were some candidates. I mean, I, I've worked for many years in scripting languages and done, I think, um, probably as clever things as can be done in scripting languages, sort of reached the limit of cleverness of, of Perl, for example. Um, and made it work very well, but 
those kinds of languages like Perl or Python or Ruby or, you know, pick your favorite one and say why it's great, but it's not going to be memory and CPU efficient enough, right? You're not going to be able to capture and decode queries off the network at wire speed without high, C without high overhead, for example, in those languages. Um, also, they always require a runtime to be installed, and so that, that's just right out. Java also requires a runtime, so that one's out. Um, Scala, Erlang, Clojure, hipster languages also get eliminated for the same kinds of, of uh, reasons. And it essentially, you know, a few years ago before Google wrote Go, we would have been stuck with C and C++. And the problem with C and C++ is that programmers have to manage their memory. Programmers have to deal with the difficulties of concurrent programming, you know, multi-threaded programming. Um, this is very difficult. You have to find really good people to do this. I'm certainly not qualified myself. Uh, you make mistakes, you end up with things that seg fault and die on you, so forth and so on. And, um, you know, sure, there's people who can do it. Oh, and by the way, then you have to, you know what, what uh, cross-platform portable C and C++ look like, right? <laughs> if def's all over the place. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a nightmare in terms of, like, if I can avoid that, I want to. So fortunately, um, Go lets us make that choice. Um, and I don't think that there's another language in existence right now that really strikes all the same balance of the same requirements that Go does. So memory and CPU efficiency, Go is compiled. Um, it compiles down to native code. And if you're careful, you can get about as fast as you can get with C or C++. There are lots of um, benchmarks that you can go search for, which were run on somebody's MacBook and purport to show that Java is much faster than Go or C is much faster than Go. And then you can go and look at the Go language creators rebuttals to those benchmarks and how they uh, just exposed that some silly things were being done in tight loops or something like that and regained all of the efficiency that was said to have been lost. Um, so studying this for a while, I was convinced that Go could be very memory and very CPU efficient. And Go is fanatically careful about memory allocation. Um, just because it's a garbage collected and memory managed language doesn't mean that you can just be careless about it. You actually have to think about what you're doing with memory. And in fact, one of our agents had a persistent memory problem and took us quite a while to figure out where. It's not a memory leak, but we were actually capturing some data that we weren't using. <laughs> um, and so one of, our, one of our agents would bloat over time. Um, so you, you do have to be careful even with Go about what you're doing with memory. But you can write very efficient code in Go. Um, and so that's a, that's a good reason to choose it. Concurrency and correctness are easy in Go. Go has these primitives built in that are based on communicating sequential processes principles. And so writing things in Go often feels like um, backgrounding shell scripts. Uh, for example, the Go keyword allows you to run a function. You can think of it like a, like a lightweight green thread or something like that. And it allows you to run that concurrently with other processes. And then these processes, these, these Go routines, can communicate with each other in a clean way that doesn't require any synchronization. Synchronization is handled by these primitives for you. And it's very efficient. And it makes what otherwise would be code full of callbacks or code full of mutexes or code full of all kinds of nasty things. It makes those, um, those things very elegant and almost unremarkable code in Go. So you write something, you're like, well, this is exactly what it should look like to write processes that do work concurrently with each other. And, um, you know, there's still ways that you can abuse that. You know, if you don't know what you're doing and if you do something silly, you can. Um, Go doesn't absolutely ironclad protect you against doing something like um, accessing a global variable from two Go routines concurrently with no protection. Uh, so you have to be careful. I mean, you, have to, you still have to think about what you're doing. But the point is that you can, with clean and elegant code and, and without much difficulty, write programs that are concurrent and correct. Um, Go compiles down into static binaries with all of the dependencies linked in, including these days with the newer releases of Go. Uh, one of our agents ships with libpcap. And uh, we can even um, embed our own version of libpcap into the binary. So when we deploy the binary, whether it's to our own servers or whether it's an agent to our customers, it is a single self-contained executable. We don't have to ship libraries along with it. We don't have to worry that there's a different version of some system library that needs to be included. It just goes along with it. And um, this is very familiar to me. I, I immediately understood how important this was because 
for the past six years, I've developed what eventually became Percona Toolkit in Perl. And I ran into all of the same kind of problems with any sort of a dependency on an external module or something like that. And so the, um, the technique that eventually solved those problems for me was to combine all of my modules into one program. You essentially take all of your Perl modules and concatenate them together, and then you, you execute the result. And so it's a, it's a program with modules embedded. And so um, I was familiar with the kinds of um, problems that you could solve with that approach and the benefits that you could get from it. So everything's totally self-contained and um, doesn't require external dependencies. So yeah, we chose Go. So, um, you know, Go has all of these really nice properties, but there's also um, a great efficiency for programmers and a lot of fun for programmers. And when you're building an organization, this is not something to overlook. Um, Go is by far my favorite programming language now, and we've just hired somebody really senior who's a um, long-term expert in C and C++. It's like the, the fourth time we've hired somebody of those sorts of qualifications. One week in, and you know, he's sending things on our chat channel like, I'm starting to really love Go. <laughs> and it's a familiar feeling for me. Um, you know, I, I didn't quite have the experience that some people report with Go. Um, sometimes if you read on the mailing lists or the, the official Go blogs or something like that, they say a programmer can be productive in Go in a day and proficient in a couple of weeks. And I'm slower than that. Um, and I haven't seen anybody be really productive in a day yet. But it is a, it's a pretty minimal language. It actually it's about, has about half the keywords of C. So it's really nice to work with. So it's just, it's so much fun. It does have some, some drawbacks. Um, the first and most obvious of those is that it's new. And this was the first thing that I did a whole bunch of experimentation with before choosing it. Um, because I wanted to make sure, for example, that there were good MySQL drivers. Because a great programming language without the package and library support is going to be a whole bunch of extra work. You're going to have to build those things yourselves. But fortunately, the package ecosystem is actually pretty decent. Um, the core libraries that ship with Go are complete for almost anything that needs to be done. We're only using a couple of external packages, one for um, one for interacting with libpcap, one for interacting with MySQL. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, we, we achieved most of what we need to with Go's built-in packages. Um, but that was a concern, and it could be a concern. I mean, there's, there's, even though I think the package support is pretty good and the, the library is pretty complete, it still doesn't approach you know, the libraries that are available for C or C++ or even other languages. You know, it's just not that old of a language yet. The documentation can be, um, you know, there, there were times when I would read through the documentation and go, okay, um, I don't feel like that explained everything. <laughs> and uh, then I would realize, like, interacting with the, the database SQL package, for example, which is the, the interface that's used for accessing a, row, a, a relational database, um, I, would I, I would eventually learn something and then realize that it was mentioned in the documentation once and only once. <laughs> And that's kind of how Go is. <laughs> the documentation for Go kind of follows that con convention too, that it's minimal. It's like there is absolutely no repetition. And so you have to read the documentation really carefully. And in some cases, you have to read the source code, um, which is actually encouraged as well. I mean, I don't think they want to duplicate the source code in the documentation. So it's just it's something to be aware of if you're learning Go. You know, Pay attention. Every word in the documentation is usually there for a good reason. Like, I think there's only one place in the database SQL documentation where they kind of mention almost offhand that there's a pool of connections. So it does connection pooling for you. And I missed that for months. I thought we were going to have to write our own connection pooling. And, but it is it's mentioned there in some way. Debugging, you can actually debug Go with GDB, but, um, and I, I'm not an expert in using GDB, and I'm not an expert in compiled binaries. I've been working in scripting languages for so long um, I mean, I'm familiar with using a command line debugger. I did that day in and day out with Perl, for example. But debugging in Go doesn't feel quite as easy. Uh, it's, um, you know, you can, you can start in, in GDB and everything works just fine once you're used to what you're doing, but it, you load the, the, uh, the binary a little bit differently in Go than you do in any other program, um, in any compiled C program, and I was just, it was a little bit unfamiliar with me. So it could be just a little bit easier, but it's still certainly possible. 
And finally, packages in Go are not versions. So you can't say, I want to import you know, this version of the MySQL connection package. Um, you, you specify, I want, I want to import the MySQL connection package, and then you get whatever version is at that URL. Because Go has a, um, a URL-based import convention that works together with all of its tools very nicely. Um, and this took me a long time to kind of figure out how to work with this convention instead of against it. Um, and then after I sort of got my head around it, it's actually very simple and should have been obvious to me, I think. But after I finally got my head around that, then I realized, oh, I really like package versioning so that I could pin, I could specify one to link a certain version of a package into my, into my application. Um, but that's not available. Go isn't. Go packaging is not, not versioned and probably never will be due to how the language is designed. So these are some things that you know, are either things to be aware of or things to, to work around. There's some things that are absolutely unsatisfied requirements in Go um, that I wanted to impose. I mean, these, these things don't have to be ironclad require, requirements, but I wanted to make them requirements for sanity and because I had learned some of these lessons the hard way. So repeatable builds, for example. Since packages are not versioned, um, if you build an application once and then you build it again, um, you, could, you could be using different versions of your packages, and so you don't know exactly which versions of packages were used to build any particular binary. Daemonization is not supported in Go because fork is not supported. Um, we needed our, our agents to be able to supervise themselves in very much of a um, init script run kind of a um, you know, functionality. And of course there's nothing in the language <laughs> or the packages for that, so we had to figure out how to build our own. Um, being able to remotely inspect agents that are installed on someone else's stuff over which we have no access, that's important. And as I mentioned before, handling errors that we can't foresee. All of these things are really important requirements that I had to figure out how to satisfy. And it, of course, there's always a choice of you know, do you go down the lonely road of inventing your own stuff or do you look for, for things that other people have built and try and use something that, that might exist for this? Um, here's my obligatory scriptural quote. <laughs> you invent what hasn't been done yet. Um, so we found some things had been done and uh, we found some other things that had not been done and that we needed to, to invent ourselves. So number one was repeatable builds. and. Um, so for me, a repeatable build means that I can actually take a binary and figure out how to reproduce it in source code. The exact versions of all of the packages and libraries that were used to build it. Just from the binary itself, I shouldn't have to do anything like take the binary and go look up its MD5 sum in some uh, uh, database of builds somewhere, although that's not a bad thing to do. I want the binary itself to have the evidence within it. So we built a system um, where we actually capture the git SHA inside the binary itself at the time of building. Uh, and we do this without modifying the git repository. And uh, so then we add a, a command line flag that will print that, print that SHA out. So we can take any of our binaries that's deployed somewhere and just execute it with that command line flag and get the SHA. Now we can go back to the repository that that binary was, was built from, check it out to that SHA, and then look at a file called godeps in the git repository. That godeps file, this is something we invented, is a simple um, format of one line per external dependency and has the name of the, ex the, the import path of the external dependency and then has the git SHA. This is um, git specific, obviously, but it allows us to check out our repository to a point in time and then figure out what other versions of other packages were linked into that same binary. Um, so uh, we, we built and open source some tools to do this. We call it Johnny Depps for Depths meaning dependencies, of course. Um, it's, it's available there. There's some um, supporting documentation explaining how we do what we do. Uh, there's also a couple of blog posts on our blog about that, but you can get all the information from here if you want. And I've had several people tell me that this has uh, been helpful to them. It seems to be pretty popular on you know, GitHub. It's got a bunch of stars and people watching it. And it's been discussed a bunch in the, um, the Go Google Plus communities and things like that. So. It seems to be kind of just right, I guess. I mean, it, it, it feels just right to my taste, um, and I guess some other people agree with that too. So it's certainly useful for us to be able to just ask a binary how to, re how to reproduce itself. 
Our next challenge was demonizing um, these, uh, these agents because as you know, probably, um, daemons have specific characteristics and um, init scripts in Unix often require whatever is being init scripted to daemonize itself. So if you go and write a red hat init script and then you service start whatever it is, um, if it doesn't daemonize itself, it'll actually just block the console. And that's not good. <laughs> we, need, uh, we needed the Go programs to daemonize themselves. Um, and it, a, a daemonized process should, uh, usually a typical Unix daemon forks itself a couple of times to do things like detach from controlling TTYs and close its file handles and change its current working directory to slash so it doesn't hold a mounted file system mounted and all of these kinds of things. Um, but fork is not available in Go. Because of the way that Go routines are written on a pool of threads, um, and if you tried to do it unsafely by calling out to a, uh, the C fork library, as you can do in Go, you can call C functions, um, that would be very, very unsafe and unwise to do that because your, your code would not execute before setup routines in other packages execute, which could potentially have started some, some uh, threads running in those threads and the way threading and forking interacts. It's all very bad juju. So we had to figure out how to do this ourselves. Um, so our agents daemonize themselves using exec instead of fork. So instead of forking uh, once or twice, we exec once or twice. So the program starts up and, and looks at an environment variable and goes, I am number one. I'm gonna start number two and exit. So it does that and it sets the environment, changes the environment slightly for number two to look at. When number two starts up, it goes, I look at my environment and I, I'm number two. So I do a couple of other things, you know, closing some file handles and chaduring and all of these kinds of things. And then I fork number three, change its environment, um, exec it, and then execute myself. And then number three starts up and goes, I'm the final one in the line of succession. It restores its environment to the original um, and runs along happily. So we've open sourced a library, I'll show you in a minute to do this. There's some potential problems with this. Um, one is that the PID actually changes. So if you're used to, um, you know, exec a process and look at um, the, uh, the PID in your shell, the um, dollar exclamation point, wait, dollar, uh, dollar question mark, dollar exclamation point, dollar question mark, variable um, to see what the, um, the PID of the last backgrounded process was, this won't work. You know, you're starting up a process and you could get its PID, um, but that, that one has immediately executed another one and exec ex exited itself. So the PID is gonna change twice actually. So this could be a disadvantage for some systems. Um, standard out and standard error get closed and uh, trying to reopen those to uh, the right place is something that we've actually been working on over the last couple of days. It's a potential bug introduced by this process. And it's, it's not helped by the fact that Go, you know, one of Go's packages has, um, the OS package has two variables called standard out and standard error. And those are files, file handles that are opened to dev standard out and dev standard error uh, with the appropriate file descriptor numbers one and two. And you, you, those are mutable um, variables. They're global and public in that package. So you could change them, but you're not gonna change them before the log package actually gets initted and the log package keeps a copy of them. And then some of Go's internal packages actually use log to print some stuff to standard out and standard error, which are going nowhere. Um, so there's, there's kind of a chicken before egg sort of a problem here with, with daemonizing and handling these file handles properly. Um, so we'll, um, last night one of my guys I think found the solution to that, but I don't know what it is yet. So this is kind of, you know, if you roll your own daemonizing um, and you don't do it the way that it's been done for time out of mind, you might run into these kinds of things. I think we'll have this solved pretty soon. Um, and here's Go Daemon, and I'm showing this beautiful picture of an overly HDR'd cathedral as an illustration of why it may or may not be a desirable thing to do unnatural acts to something of beauty. <laughs> um, supervising processes. So we actually have several agents. Um, there's one whose job is to discover what's in the environment and uh, report that and register it in our API. And um, then based on what the API responds, it is going to download and 
install and execute other agents. So we call this this supervisor agent, Agent 007, for obvious reasons, I hope. And um, this one is now going to act as its own sort of like little micro in its script system. It's going to start and stop and reconfigure and manage these other agents. And the question arises then, how do we do this reliably? What happens if agent 007 gets killed, for example, and the, the, the other agents are still running? Agent 007 is the one that daemonizes itself. So it's become a process group leader and all of these kinds of happy things. And when it execs another agent, they inherit those properties. They're also running as daemons. But what happens if agent 007 dies and gets restarted by upstart or something like that? Um, how do we deal with that? So there's basically two reliable ways to have a program um, monitor and supervise other programs in Unix. One is it, there, there has to be a parent-child PID relationship between them. And when a, when a child exits, you catch sig child and react to it. And that, that sig child is guaranteed to be delivered to you. But that won't work for us because agent 007 might not be alive anymore. The parent itself might die. Um, and uh, this is a, <laughs> you know, something that we've actually observed happening. You know, somebody kills agent 007 and then restarts it and it has to start up and start managing these um, other agents that are no longer its child processes. So the other way to reliably do this is to, um, to make the agents open and lock a file, and then the agent 007 should try and lock that same file. As long as the supervised agent is still alive, the kernel will maintain the integrity of that locking. And if you, if you as the supervisor agent are able to get a lock on that file that should be locked by an agent, then you know for sure that the agent, uh, the child agent is dead. So those are basically the only two choices to reliably determine and manage when, um, when uh, other processes are alive or dead. So this is fine for you know, agent 007 managing all of the other agents, but who's managing um, agent 007? And <laughs> it's turtles all the way down, right? So ultimately there's no, there's no absolute strong guarantee of, of how to do this. We have to rely on the operating system to start, the, the operating system's init process to start agent 007, and from there on we can manage the other agents nicely. Um, and we invented this whole system ourselves because instead of using something like run it or upstart or something like that, which would be different on every system, uh, and therefore we would have to um, write system-specific code in all of these different places. It's much better to write just one set of code that's going to be predictably the same everywhere. And the only uh, difference that we actually have from system to system now is the init script that we ship. It's also a good thing to be able to remotely inspect um, agents. So the supervisor agent, agent 007, can do things like fetching log files from one of the other agents, which is super helpful, except when those agents are writing to standard error that goes to dev null, <laughs> uh, which is one of the, the problems that I said we're fixing over the last couple of days. Um, Go comes with a whole bunch of nice other features, like um, CPU and memory profiling is built in in user space, and that's, um, there's some articles on golang.org about that, so that's really easy to do, and um, highly helpful to be able to do that remotely. And of course, we can instruct our agent to stop other agents and restart them, reconfigure them. All of the configuration comes through from our API. Um, so you know, if we, if we update our configuration database, we need to send a signal for the appropriate agent to be restarted. And upgrading and downgrading, and in fact, the agent 007 will even upgrade and downgrade itself. Uh, so there's a couple of things that you have to do. For example, if you're going to make the supervisor agent upgrade itself, <laughs> Um, you have to cope with what's going to happen if it stops working, like if the new version won't work. And, um, you know, it's sort of like rebooting your server. You hope that, <laughs> remotely rebooting your server, you hope that it's going to reboot itself. <laughs> uh, so what we, what we do there, for example, is um, Agent 007 will start a copy of the new version of itself and then wait for a little bit to see if it's going to die. If it dies right away, it just rolls itself back and reports that. If the new version starts okay and seems to be running okay, then the old version will shut itself down. So not foolproof, but so far that has actually worked and hasn't failed in, in practice. Um, 
errors. There's a whole long discussion about this. This was a, a really pretty intensive topic, debating the, the right way to handle errors on a system where you can't actually observe the errors. So there's known errors. There's like, you know, a file might, you might not have permission to open a file or file might not exist or something like that. And Go has really nice error handling capabilities, but there's also the kind of fatal errors that are uh, called panics in Go. It's essentially, you can think of it as a, an exception being thrown. It's something similar to that kind of mechanism, but not really the same kind of thing. Um, and panics can happen when you, for example, um, try to dereference a nil pointer or uh, access beyond the, the end of an array or something like that. And there's a few other circumstances in which panics can happen. And um, we're writing, so, so to give some idea, uh, we're capturing network traffic for MySQL and we're decoding the, the MySQL protocol. So we've got some code that needs to be very, very efficient there. Um, and and that's, that's, for efficiency, it doesn't necessarily always look super elegant, which means it's a little harder to reason about. And then we're, uh, so then, then we're capturing the queries out of that traffic and then we're abstracting the queries by lower casing and throwing away white space and throwing away literals and all of these kinds of things. So we get the fingerprint of a query, the signature of the query that we're going to then um, uh, accumulate metrics on. And this has to be extremely efficient too. And uh, in the past lives I've done this with regular expressions which if anybody else has ever done regular expression based um, parsing like that, you know, it's, it's pretty much a nightmare and by no means efficient. So we've got an algorithm that does this extremely efficiently at the cost of being non-obvious. You know, we're, we're down to really low level like byte handling code, one byte at a time. And um, we actually did get an array dereference past the end of an array. And we got this in production, we had never seen it in our environment. Um, but before we got this problem, I had already anticipated that we might get that. So we, we use a technique that I call robustly.run. And yesterday there was a talk where somebody called run calmly, <laughs> which sounded very similar to me, um, also in a Go program. Um, but there's still, gonna be, there's still gonna be the kinds of errors that you can't really guess at. And we need to be able to handle those. And the reason, so, so the debate was, you know, we really shouldn't try and handle errors like this we should let the system crash and throw stack traces and then we should analyze the stack traces and fix the errors because if you try and handle these things, I mean, because by definition you can't figure out what the error is, you can't guess at it, uh, you're not gonna be able to figure out what the system state is, you're not gonna be able to guess what the system state is and you're not gonna be able to guess whether it's safe to try and make the process continue in that kind of a state. So, you know, there, there's sort of two schools of thought. One is you gotta die and figure out what the problem is and fix it. And then the other school of thought is, is it acceptable to do that? And my experience in processing, you know, lots and lots of data really quickly like this um, is that whenever you have some one in a million error, um, just the law of large numbers comes into effect and it ends up very quickly making your program completely useless, right? So I've got on my slide 40,000 queries per second. If we're decoding 40,000 queries per second from MySQL traffic, which is, totally feasible, lots of people are running 40,000 queries per second on their servers, and we have a one in a million error, our agent is gonna survive for an average of 25 seconds. And that's gonna make that agent completely useless. I would much rather have um, capture 999,999 of those queries, crash and recover on the millionth, and continue providing almost all of the value that that agent is, tend is intended to provide. So. So the answer to this, uh, this question, should we handle such errors for me is yes, because if we don't, then we're, you know, we're just gonna end up in a nightmare where our agents are, are not actually able to do any um, useful work. And then the final question is, does this add bugs? And the answer is yes. So there's, you know, every code is an opportunity for adding more bugs, but we're zenful. <laughs> um, so we wrote robust, or I wrote, I'll take the blame for it. <laughs> Uh, because there are certain schools of thought, including half of my brain, that says this is kind of a bad idea. Um, it's on GitHub, and it's a, it's a fairly simple little package that runs a process inside of a Go routine. You give it a function to run, it executes the function, and then it uses Go's built-in recover to catch if there's a panic. 
So if there's a panic, it catches it and it increments an exponentially weighted moving average of the rate of panics. And if that rate, exponentially weighted uh, rate of panics is too large for too long, two configuration parameters to this function, then instead of catching and restarting, it'll throw another panic and kill the whole program. So we want to be able to handle you know, errors once every 25 seconds or something like that. Um, and we want to, to be able to capture that information and, and fix, obviously, and ship a new agent to handle it. Um, but we do not want to get in, into an infinite loop of restarting this, this process that's failing. So we will crash if, it's, you know, if, it's, if this error is just happening too much. We will crash ourselves. Um, it uses our exponentially weighted moving average library, which we also open sourced. Um, the problem that this brings in is that panic handling and daemonizing may not play well together. So there's a couple of, a couple of potential bugs that come here. I already mentioned that we're um, fixing bugs right now with the way that we daemonize and writing output. You know, some, some parts of Go or the program itself will write output to standard error, which is, have been, has been set to nil. Um, in these daemonized programs. Also, when I wrote this, I didn't build in enough instrumentation. I'm probably going to have to change the interface to it to make sure that the instrumentation around how often those errors are caught and, and so forth um, and the error messages themselves are actually propagated back to the caller instead of being isolated within this little um, scope in which this, this function is being executed and re-executed. And also, like everything else, there's no strong protection against uh, doing something silly like accessing something outside of your scope. So one of these Go routines that executes quote unquote robustly had better not mess with global state, for example. That could really cause some problems if it changes global state and then gets restarted and expects the global state to be in a certain way and then it's not. And so you know we're very careful in the way that we use this. Um, but you know these these are potentially bugs that can be introduced, um, and that's pretty much it. And I've gone much more quickly than I had planned to. Uh, in summary, I don't believe that ROUSs exist in our fire swamp. We've pretty much tackled and um, been able to overcome all of the problems that we've found so far. And things are running robustly and resiliently and efficiently for all all, all of our clients. Um, with the odd bug, of course, I mean, we're a startup, so our beta users are very nice to us and report bugs and tolerate things like the occasional agent that mysteriously we can't fix its memory usage for a couple of weeks. Um, but things are working really well, and uh, I don't think that we would have been able to do this in, in C or C++, certainly not in the amount of time that we've been able to do it and with the number of engineers that we have. Um, Go is pretty remarkable in that regard. Also. Everybody in our company essentially is new to writing Go, and I don't think that a new programmer in most programming languages could, could accomplish the kinds of things that we've been able to do with Go. I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. How are our testing suites? Actually, that's a great point. I completely forgot to give myself a slide to remind myself to talk about that. Um, so let me start just briefly by saying that Go is built for testability. It's very, a very nice language in that regard. Um, along with this robustly stuff, if you look at our uh, readme on the GitHub repository, we have in that robustly uh, package, we also, in addition to the run function, we have a function called crash. And it does crash injection. And you can, um, you can configure a line and file where you want to crash. And the, the only way to be sure that this robustly stuff actually works is to deliberately inject crashes and then make sure that it works. And in doing this, I found, for example, that one of our Go routines was spawning another Go routine that I hadn't thought about. Well, there's no sort of contained within relationship between Go routines. They are peers. So if we robustly run one Go routine wrapped in this little wrapper to restart it, and then it spawns another Go routine, that one is unmanaged. And if it crashes and throws a panic, that's going to kill the whole program. So, you know, judicious use of crash injection testing was necessary to figure out whether or not we actually were, were going to catch and recover from all of the, the potential sources of panics in all of our routines. Um, otherwise, in terms of um, uh, 
testing suite, we have a pretty extensive testing suite. Some things are harder to test than others, even though Go makes testing pretty easy, even for things like HTTP servers. And um, by the way, we also use Go for all of our backend processes, our API servers, all of those things are written in Go just to keep the number of languages to a minimum. Um, so we have, for example, that, that query digesting algorithm that I mentioned, extensive test suite on that. Um, I'm not sure how many tests, uh, probably several hundred for that. Um, you know, other things are, are also extensively tested. There are some things where, especially when you're iterating rapidly on something and you're basically prototyping and you don't know what the final functionality is gonna be, you don't wanna go, well, here's what I think we might do and I'm just gonna go ahead and pour a whole bunch of concrete and set that thing in stone with some test cases. Um, so what I usually do, um, I almost always encourage people to write more tests than they want to, including myself. Um, but in cases like that, I mean, you can get a pretty good intuition for which kinds of test cases, such as decoding queries, are going to be really helpful in preventing errors. Things like, let's say, downsampling time series data, perfect case for lots and lots of off by one errors and all of these kinds of things. We test the heck out of those things. Other things like, you know, command line parsing, uh, we have a little wrapper around, uh, around Go's command line parsing with pretty good test coverage for it, maybe like 80%, not 100%, I don't think. Does that answer your question? Yes. Are you asking whether we store it on the agents uh, on their side? Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is, do our agents store and buffer any of their data that they're going to send to the API locally in case something crashes so that it can be retried and resent? And no, we don't do that, and that was a very conscious decision. Um, and there were lots of, of ideas proposed. For example, use zero MQ, you know, or, or something like that. Um, you know, somebody, someone else that I talked to about building a service like this had said that it was gonna use RabbitMQ for all the same kinds of reasons that you might wanna use these kinds of things. You know, if something is down, if the APIs are down, something can get queued and retried and you don't lose your data. Um, but the, the hazard that comes in with any of these things is that that adds extra bugs and whatever, whatever you're storing locally, whether it's in memory or on disk, has the potential to bloat and fill up some resource like memory or disk, and that's a real, real hazard. Um, so I've learned to be very careful over the years. You know, just like my years at Percona, I ran more than one server out of disk space for a customer. And you always feel like the lowest, lowest person on earth when you do that. You know, you're the expert consultant and you just crashed their server. <laughs> oh, and you thought your server had problems before. You know, here, let me fill your disk up. Um, so no, we don't do that. Uh, we do have an aggregator agent, which is uh, similar to Etsy's StatsD for all of the reasons that Etsy wrote StatsD. Uh, it listens on UDP for all the same reasons as well. And our agents send their time series metrics to this aggregator agent, which batches them up and ships them off to our API. And um, it maintains a, um, a round robin list of a few samples a few minutes worth of data in case our API has a problem. It will retry them, but otherwise we don't. Uh, you know, we have a bounded, a bounded buffer there, but otherwise we don't do, we don't write anything to disk other than log files. And we wanted to be really careful about that. That's a great point to build up because I think uh, that, would be a, that would be a way that we could turn this into a disaster. Anyone else? All right. Well, I am all out. Uh, photo credits, contact info. Thanks, everyone.